live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first um, online uh, Institute of Physics talk at the Open University. Um, obviously, it's been some time since you've seen me. Um, so uh, we had to cancel a number of lectures earlier in the year because of this, the sudden onset of the current situation. Um, and we're hoping to return to some sense of normality in uh, hosting these this lecture series again um, starting this term so we'll hopefully carry on um, in the same way that we have been for many years. Um, I will just quickly go over how we're holding this online uh, lecture so um, on our end the broadcast is being held as a call um, between myself um, Sir Peter Knight our speaker and then we've got um, Alice Dunford, who's going to help monitoring questions um, coming in, and we've got um, Keith on the call here, who is um, how handling our AV. So hopefully everything goes smoothly with the technology tonight. Um, you will have seen on the holding slide, and I believe it's on the stadium page as well, yeah, there's a link to our email box, which is uh, stem-sbs-iop-lecture at open.ac.uk. If you have any questions for the speaker as we go through, please email them to that address. Uh, myself and Alice will, will monitor that inbox and um, we will ask as many questions as we have time for at the end of the lecture today. Um, this, this lecture will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel if you want to refer to it at a later date. Um, then we've also um, got some announcements about um, the next lectures coming up. So um, it's very likely that our next lecture will be on the subject of the dawn of gravitational wave astronomy, which will be given by Dr. Christopher North, who um, at the moment is the head of public outreach at Cardiff University. So that is set. Uh, please note there's a later time. So that is set for a start time of 8 p.m on um, the 10th of November, so that's our normal time, the second Tuesday of next month. Um, and then it's uh, likely that on December 8th, so that's the second Tuesday of December, this will return to our usual time of 7.30 p.m. Um, and there will be a talk um, in some way relating to the moon. We have um, some level of commitment, but we're not, uh, we haven't quite got a title in yet. Um, so there'll be a talk related to the moon and probably uh, the discovery of water on the moon. Um, so look out for uh, marketing emails um, coming out from the IOP and uh, also on our Twitter account um, detailing events, uh, how to join those. Hopefully it'll be the same manner in which you've joined, you've, you've, you've joined this event tonight. Um, there, if you want to be on the mailing list, so there was some information on the holding slide, but I'll just repeat it again. Um, if you want to join the mailing list to be informed about these lectures going forward, please e either email us at the uh, the uh, email address on the stadium page, or you can also email the Institute of Physics directly. Um, so the address for that is email marketing at iop.org, and then ask to be added to the Milton Keynes Talks um, email list. You can also follow us on social media with a Twitter page, uh, which is OU underscore SBS. And that's our departmental page where these talks are also advertised. Uh, final piece of housekeeping. Um, you will notice there's a link on the stadium page to a Google form where there's um, just three or four demographic questions. Um, I hope that uh, most of you will be able to find some time to just um, go on that go on that form, spend a minute or two just filling out those questions for us um, and sending your response. Um, we just want to keep an eye on the demographics of our audience today since we have no other way of really monitoring who's here. We can't really look out into the audience as we normally do. Um, so it just helps us keep track of the kind of audience that we're reaching and if we want to modify our, our marketing in some way to reach other groups that may be less well represented in our um, in our audiences. So I think that's the housekeeping out of the way. 
Um, so that just leaves me to introduce the talk and today's speaker. So today we've got um, Sir Peter Knight, um, formerly of Imperial. Um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. There. Formerly of, uh, of Imperial um, London. So Peter began his studies at um, Sussex University. He started his undergrad and went on to complete his Doctor of Philosophy there also. Um, he spent a number of years in the US taking a PDRA position at the University of Rochester and then moved to the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center um, at Stanford in the US. He then moved back to the UK as a research fellow at Sussex University and later became visiting science scientist at um, John Hopkins University in the United States. He became research fellow at Royal Holloway London and then transferred to Imperial, where he worked his way up to becoming professor in 1988 and remained for the majority at Imperial for the rest of his career until retirement. Since then, since his professorship, he's gone on to hold um, positions such as president of the Optical Society of America in 2004, being the first non-North American uh, to do so. And he was the president of the Institute of Physics from 2011 to 2013. He's been a leading figure in the field of quantum optics and continues to advise government, industry and the Ministry of Defence through memberships on advisory board, boards and was chief scientific advisor to the National Physics Laboratory. He was knighted in the Queen's 2005 birthday honours and has received many awards for his work, some of which I'll list here, uh, the Thomas Young Medal and Glazebrook Medal from the Institute of Physics, and also the Faraday Medal last year from the Institution of Engineering and Technology for his outstanding contribution to quantum information science. Um, he's written a number of books on quantum optics and is passionate about the role that science plays in economic development. So I'm very interested to hear his take on um, the future of how quantum technology is going to play a larger part in our uh, culture and society going forwards. So um, I think I'll leave it to Peter now to, to start his lecture. Thank you, Ben. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about is, is, is quantum technology um, uh, and, and what it is and why suddenly, right around the world, a very large number of countries have started to invest in this area. Um, so on this on this initial slide uh, that you, you can see, um, there, there are a number of people that are involved in supporting this. Um, Bayes, the, the government department, EPSRC, the Research Council, Innovate UK, Knowledge Transfer Network, DSDL, the National Physical Laboratory and the National Cyber Security Centre. These are all partners in, in a managed programme that I'm going to be describing. So let's have a look at how this particular programme uh, evolved. You know, what, what, what is it? What is quantum physics? Um, and of course, the obvious thing is quantum physics is good for, and um, it stops atoms from disintegrating. Um, but we've been living in a quantum age for ever since 1926. We, we, we know how, now how to build things that allow transistors and lasers to work and so on. Um, so that's very much a contribution to our everyday life. Uh, quantum also <laughs> helps you to sell, to sell new age books. Um, there are two there that are on my shelves. I wouldn't necessarily say I recommend them. Um, and of course, to make TV programs. That's what that's the obvious things that 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 this stuff's good for. Um, but let's have a look at, at what else there is. Um, you might think that I'm going to be speaking about quantum computing, and I will, but it's not just that. And, and what I tried to show in this slide is a kind of funnel um, of, of, of timelines about what we're trying to exploit in this next generation of quantum science. If you look at lasers, semiconductors, and so on, they, they already exploit a lot of quantum features. But one of the other features of quantum physics is the enabling to be in what's called superposition states. 
in 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 allowing systems to be built quantum mechanical systems that are in the superposition of more than one state now this sounds quite bizarre but it is something that, that that's actually being used quite quite readily already so on this timeline there's a very long distance goal and when we started this program we thought quantum computing absolutely a paradigm of, 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 of a game changer in quantum science about 15 years away. And the reason it's 15 years away at that time is, is that to build these funny quantum superpositions, there's an extraordinary fragility about these superpositions and you have to shield them. They're very fragile because they actually talk to the outside world really very effectively. But that's precisely what you need if you want to build novel kinds of sensors. So you can see backtracking, we've got sensors, we've got new sorts of communication technologies, and there's an, a more immediate one, which is clocks. And already, most of you are using the fact that we make atomic superpositions in your everyday world, because that's how sat-navs work. Sat-navs work because there are atomic clocks that can be used to do basically coordination to work out where you are on the Earth's surface as it talks to a number of satellites. So there's a whole range of things with new kinds of applications. And, and this little little memo slide at the beginning really tells me what what the kind of things that I'm I'm I'm, I'm I need to remember to tell you about. Right now, quantum bits and quantum registers. Let's, let's first talk about classical bits and classical registers. Now, the kind of bits that we're used to in a classical computer could be put together in, in states zeros and ones. Okay, so a three bit register classically can be in states zero, 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 up to one, one, one. Okay, so there are eight possibilities. But what about in quantum science? Well, quantum science, it's fairly straightforward to make a quantum system that could also register a zero or a one. But better, we can actually make it in a superposition of zero and one at the same time. Now, let's do that for the quantum register with three quantum bits. I can put the quantum register into a superposition of all of those eight possibilities simultaneously. Suddenly, I hope you can see that we have a scale issue here of great importance. If you have n quantum bits in superposition, there are two to the n states. So if I can man manage to, to put together, say, a thousand bits in superposition, the number of states of that register is, a, is two to the 1,000 which is more than the number of particles in the visible universe. So a thousand quantum bits under control already will exceed the performance of the largest machine you would ever imagine. OK, that's the challenge. And before anybody gets excited, we're nowhere near a thousand at the moment. But this, the, the, the gap is closing rapidly. So why quantum? Quantum technologies give you new capabilities, and those capabilities are really disruptive. There's a whole raft of things that, that, that it impacts. In particular, it impacts the cybersecurity uh, that we've become used to. And global cybersecurity is actually worth an enormous sum, predicted by, by a number of people, including the standards organization, Etsy, to be worth more than 164 billion by next year. Your GPS, your navigation system, is currently worth about 21 billion in terms of contribution to the UK economy alone. The UK photonics industry, which underpins a lot, lasers and so on, is growing at about 8% per annum. It's currently worth slightly more to the UK economy than pharmaceuticals. Not many people know that, but it's true. So we've got a great supply chain success. So I'm going to be talking a bit about what can quantum science do for you 
in terms of sensing, imaging, and some clocks as well. Right, so the quantum age, we're living in a quantum age. We have semiconductors, we have lasers, but now we're gonna try and exploit this, this coherence. And it does impact a whole raft of, of particular sectors. It gives you enhanced capabilities in timing and sensing, imaging, computing, and so on. And the idea is that you can build technology that, that, um, that's faster, cheaper, and better performing. And in the box on the right hand side are various kinds of vehicles by which you might want to do it and the components you want, might want to put together. So given that we've had this tremendous progress in quantum physics and understanding the nature of quantum physics, these odd superpositions, the Schrodinger cat states and so on, that progress since the 1990s is underpinning this second quantum revolution. And it's likely to have an impact that's going to be similar to the first one that gave us lasers and semiconductors. It's very subtle. It involves superpositions. There's this odd quantum property of entanglement. We started to see that there was room to exploit this um, towards the end of the last century, the beginning of, of this one. And we started a program that I'm going to describe about five years before anybody else did, looking for the way that this will generate new technologies in various key areas. And the game changers are, are listed there. Sensors, secure comms, and a revolution in computing. And I'm going to try and run through each of these bit by bit. So how did it all start? Um, we, we, we had the ability to demonstrate the extraordinarily strong science base in the UK in this area. Um, this, this, th th this was uh, validated by uh, one of the rolling international reviews of the nature of the subject, uh, which came out very clearly identifying quantum science as a major research strength in the UK. And so with a number of, uh, of, of uh, people who became the enthusiasts for this, um, we started in the autumn statement that led to the budget in 2013 with a commitment by the then Chancellor of the Exchequer um, of £270 million. At the time, it was the largest amount of, of resource dedicated to a, uh, an emergent or, a, te uh, or a, um, uh, a disruptive technology. Uh, and, and you can see, here's me trying to explain to, uh, to George Osborne what on earth this thing was going to do at the time of the launch. The program has actually grown since 2013, and we're running a 10 year program with a budget of about a billion pounds. So it is really a major enterprise of, of a physics based translation success story of getting great science into products that people can use. So the way that that has to work together requires a kind of alliance of the key partners. Academia, because that's where scientific knowledge and future breakthroughs are generated in, in research institutions and universities around the country. Industry, of course, because they, they, were gonna, they will quite clearly work on ways in which you could develop robust new capabilities, identify markets and opportunities. Government, because they do two things. They provide the funding for all of this, but also they, they play a major role as early adopters and procurement of the technology. And one of the things that we work really hard to do in this particular program is to integrate these into a formal structure whereby everybody is working together with a common strategy and a delivery mechanism. So how do we do it? The first thing we did is realize that we needed to find a mechanism to pull in the research groups around the country to work coherently and cooperatively. So we, we identified a number of, th of themes, four themes, and you can recognize them from what I've already been saying. Sensing and timing, communications, imaging, and computing. So we set up four hubs those hubs are headquarters, but the four hubs have something like 30 universities involved. 
And, and it's unusual to have that coordinated and cooperative program anywhere in the world, but it has worked incredibly effectively. So on clocks, we're going to be talking quite a lot about time stamping. What happens if GPS goes out? How do you get your timing in terms of a holdover? In quantum metrology and sensing, what can you do to exploit these, these fragile entanglement states and superpositions for, for sensitive measurement systems and sensors? Secure comms, new communication channels. And I'm going to tell you something about how you, do, you can distribute keys to, to encrypt data quantum simulators. Um, that's a step towards quantum computing where you use a quantum system to simulate other quantum systems to understand new molecules, drug discovery and new materials. And then finally, quantum computing in general. And then the things that we, we put together within this hub program and to facilitate the engagement with industry, we use the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund of a challenge well, we, 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 we identify challenges where researchers and industry come together to produce new capabilities uh, in this sort of area. OK, so we're not alone, uh, although we did start substantially earlier than other countries in a coordinated program. But around the world, I, 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 I'll indicate some of them. In the United States, um, there is a national quantum initiative, uh, which is standing up around now. Uh, and the Trump administration finally did sign that one off and centers are being put together remarkably similar to our hubs. In Canada, there's an extraordinarily powerful group working in this field in Canada. Rather unbelievably, um, this is the Prime Minister of, Ca of Canada explaining what entanglement is to a general audience and he did it remarkably well. In Europe, um, there is a flagship being put together by the European Union. In Australia, there are there are two major centres uh, that are being coordinated in this sort of space. And then the really big programme is the Chinese programme. Uh, and I'll, 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 come, I'll explain a little bit about what that satellite launch is. And, and the hero of that is Jian Wei Pan in, in this, in, 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 uh, this uh, little figure on, on, on the right hand side, who's very much the architect of the Chinese programme enormously successful. So lots of activity around the world. Um, so back five years, we, we, we commissioned McKinsey on a thing that we did for The Economist magazine to try and identify the spend. Um, th this is in millions of euros around the world. And you can see the kind of scale five years ago. Britain was apparently spending 105 million euros a year. That's the non-classified bit that we are aware of. United States at 360 is the biggest one there. OK, how does it compare with now? And of course, you have, you have to, to really be cautious about trying to identify what, what's currently being spent in quantum technology now. OK, and some of, some of it is aspirational rather than real. But here we are. A huge increase in the United States spend and an absolutely massive increase in the Chinese commitment to the field. OK. So having got that 2013 promise from government of, of, of what we could do with this, we set, set up the basic delivery mechanisms with the hubs. Then what we then did is to identify working with government science advisors what quantum would do for you. Uh, Mark Walpert and I, Mark was then the government chief scientist. Um, uh, Mark and I produced this report called The Quantum Age, uh, where we tried to, and it's available online uh, and it's free. <laughs> and uh, we tried to explain in, in layman language what, what this will do in terms of opportunities, um, new capabilities, things that would really transform not only our understanding of the world, but how we could exploit it into things that affected people's ways of life. And it gave recommendation to push the program forward into a second five year phase. And of course, that's what happened. Um, this rather busy slide, this pie chart indicates where we are now. And th this is this is a kind of breakdown 
of, of where this one billion over a 10 year period came from. And the blue bit on the right hand side are the quantum technology hubs. CDTs are the doctoral training centers which fund PhD studentships. OK, the NQCC is the National Quantum Computing Center, which stood up this year with an announcement from the science minister on the launch. That will be headquarters for quantum computing based at Harwell, engaging with the, the, the whole uh, UK sector, academia and industry. That's a, a commitment of about, about 100 million. QMI is the Quantum Metrology Institute of the National Physical Laboratory, which looks at testing the evaluation of, of prototypes. And other is the various bits and pieces of other parts of government that are supporting this. We don't neglect the international engagement. In fact, there's a, uh, uh, an experimental program on intercontinental communication using quantum with Singapore, using CubeSats. And we're about to announce very soon, I think, uh, engagement with Canada on some joint activity. So it really is a huge program, which you can see where the biggest bit is. The biggest bit is this red bit. I should, I should, I should really confess at this stage I'm colorblind. I think it's red. <laughs> okay, that is the industry component through the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, and to get that going. We, 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 we made a bid to government um, and government then allowed us to commit 150, this, is, this sound like random numbers, but they're not, 153 million of industrial support providing industry demonstrated an appetite of at least 205 million in this, in this area. And they did. OK, so that's that's now the biggest component of building on the great success of the research enterprise, the blue bit, into things that are, are basically product to generate economic value, because that's the reason we persuaded governments is important. Not only do we have great science that absolutely enthralls people and really does stimulate people to have a STEM career, but also it can generate things of economic value. Right. So. How are we going to do all this stuff? Um, for the most part, if we want to keep these things under control and use these funny quantum superpositions, uh, we really need to make them cold. And uh, cold means different things to different people. OK, so my next slide indicates what cold often means to some people. Um, this is a rather extraordinary ice storm um, when I lived in upstate New York. I don't mean that cold. I mean much colder, OK? And what we're going to do is, is, is to demonstrate what happens if we cool and trap atoms. So the thing about atoms at room temperature is they move incredibly fast. And if you want to be able to manipulate them, you don't have much time to do it. So let's have a look at how fast they really move. OK, you see that one move? There's another one and another one. They're really fast. And the reason is that uh, uh, at room temperature, you can work out what the velocity is and, and you, you, it, they move at 380 miles per hour. That's a, a typical rubidium atom. At that speed, you don't have very much time in, in a normal sort of environment to actually engage with it. So we need to cool them down. OK, so cooling means slowing. If they're slower, then you can trap them. If you can trap them, you can then engage with them. You can measure and you can control. And what we're after is getting as close as we possibly can to absolute zero. And there's a reason for that. OK. So the way we, 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 we trap and cool these things is by laser irradiation. Laser cooling um, is quite effective. What we're basically doing is using the momentum of light the individual photons have when they engage with the atom. It's a bit like slowing down a bus by throwing snowballs at it. Eventually you'll get there and we have to throw a lot of photons at an atom in the right sort of way to slow them down. But when you do slow them down in that way and you can trap them, one of the quantum features starts to exhibit itself. The wave -like properties start to grow in importance for these atoms. And, and when, it, when you get down to the kind of temperatures that laser cooling allows, you basically get 
uh, a situation where the wave properties dominate everything. It's a Bose condensate. And the Bose condensate behaves like a matter wave. And it interferes just like light waves interfere. And that interference could be used if you can steer them around on a substrate or um, uh, an environment. Um, and they can measure all sorts of things, rotation, gravity, and acceleration. And that's part of what we're trying to do in the quantum sensors. So for example, can we build a quantum navigator? To build a navigator, you need an accelerometer, a gyro, um, and, and you need a decent clock. And all of that work is underway. Um, and uh, if you can do that, suddenly you discover that your cold atoms are quite sensitive to external fields, both electromagnetic fields, but also gravity. Gravity is a kind of curious thing. You, you can't shield against gravity. So you can image through walls, for example. There's a whole load of other things you can do, but gravity is sensing for, uh, for basically mineral discovery. But in electromagnetic sensors, one of the things you can do is to build new sensors. And so the, the, the rather strange picture that I've got on the right hand side here um, it is, has been produced by the, the group at the University of Nottingham as part of our national program. Uh, and these are, the, the, these are sensors in a thing that's rather similar to a cycle helmet. And they can look at functional brain imaging in a way that would normally require you to, to undergo really quite severe surgery. It actually take a piece of your skull off. This, you just put the, the cap on top, and that's already under, under trials in a hospital that's being used to try to diagnose and understand epilepsy. That's a new functionality. It does not require invasive surgery, and the group at Nottingham have been pioneering this. Right, well, gravity is an interesting thing to, 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 to look at, you can really get pictures of your local mass distribution. And that's kind of important in an awful lot of civil engineering. If we're looking at building on a ground field site, what's underneath you? Is there a mine shaft there? Is there a void? Um, and, and this is kind of important. So I've tried to indicate the specific gravity of various things. Void clearly uh, with density of zero, water with one, rock, uh, uh, two and a half to three. So you can quite clearly distinguish a void from rock um, if you're trying to build new housing, for example, on a brownfield site. Interestingly, you can also look for really nasty things of a very high specific gravity that somebody malevolent might be trying to smuggle in. Plutonium, for example, um, has, has a density close on to, to 20 and can easily be imaged in this sort of way with these sorts of devices. Remember, you can't shield gravity. Now, let's, let, me, let me move on to timing. Clocks have evolved really dramatically over the years. And this diagram really shows you uh, two things. Uh, the axes are the fractional accuracy. And you can see that it, it, it's getting better and better on a logarithmic scale. And then on the top is, is, is the frequency range. Sundials, pendulum clocks, quartz clocks, which are pretty accurate actually. The cesium fountain clock, which gives you a unit of second at the moment, it defines the SI unit. And then eventually we'll have to redefine it yet again with the new clocks that work on an optical frequency at 10 to the 15 Hertz rather than the microwave clocks that we currently use. So tremendous progress on clocks. A GPS is absolutely driven by atomic clocks. Um, your GPS system is looking at how many satellites it can find and it gets a fix looking at these things and from the time delay of the transmission of, of a, um, uh, a coded signal, you work out where you are and that's how you navigate. So GPS, has become absolutely ubiquitous. It's transformed our, the way we trade, uh, the way we timestamp, uh, all sorts of things. It synchronizes the internet, many other things. I was partly responsible for yet another one of these government office of science reports, this time on GNSS, Global Navigation System 
vulnerabilities because GPS is really dead easy to jam and it's quite straightforward to spoof and we're quite vulnerable to depending only on GPS. So we're trying to look at ways in which this quantum technology will provide a resilient timing for us so that we could flywheel over if there is an outage of GPS. Now, timing was actually the spur that led us to persuade government to give us some money. Rather peculiarly, it was the flash crash in 2010. On May the 6th, about £650 billion evaporated from the US equity market for a few minutes. It was fueled by automatic trading algorithms. A, uh, a price of Accenture share went from $40 to a cent, um, essentially instantaneously. Um, it did recover quite rapidly, but there's some hysteresis. And at the time, government were asking their science advisors um, about how we stopped automatic trades. And we said, never mind about stopping automatic trades. The money is made on beating latency as much as you possibly could. What you need to be able to do is timestamp every transaction so you know who did what in what order um, to, to signify profit and loss and blame if needed. So it's timestamping. And, and that was exactly the fuel, the, the fuel we needed uh, to actually initiate this quantum technology program in the UK. So atomic clocks provide ability to pass data reliably. It gives you the time stamping, high frequency trading. You need to do everything really accurately, with lots of synchronization and time stamping. Um, otherwise, you'll find that people are actually uh, claiming credit on trades before they've actually uh, occurred. Um, uh, and I, I mentioned how vulnerable the GNSS system is if we really do depend on it. Um, a phrase I've used there is UTC, um, Coordinated Universal Time. Um, many people don't know that we actually abandoned Greenwich Mean Time in 1961. It's been UTC for quite a long time. That came as a terrible shock to some of our government ministers who thought Greenwich Mean Time was something that we waved the flag about. Never mind, UTC we contribute to, and so, do, so does every civilized nation around the world. Well, what about imaging? What can we do with these funny quantum correlated things in terms of imaging? Um, well, we're all used to the idea of laser rangefinders, you know, the time taken for a laser pulse to go somewhere, scatter off an object, and come back to sort of gives you the distance. But what I'm going to be talking about is the way that we can do something different. We can find ways of making correlated pairs of photons, twins, if you like, highly correlated. Well, one photon acts as a trigger and alerts the user to the emission of the other, the partner. Okay, knowing when the photon was produced means that you can use very low light intensity, undetectable by anybody else. But also gives you the ability to see around corners in a way that I'm probably not going to have time to describe using the timing accuracy. So, is the way the system works in this little animation. You take ultraviolet photons born from a laser, usually fairly dim, coming in one by one, the blue ones. They're engaging here with a nonlinear crystal. That nonlinear crystal is basically splitting that blue light each blue photon into two twin red ones. The sum of the frequencies coming out adds up to the frequency of the blue one coming in. Conversion efficiency is often very, very low, but it doesn't really matter. We've got these pairs of photons coming out and they're highly correlated in a way that um, go beyond anything you can classically correlate. So how do we use them? So I thought I might tease you with the next application and it's called ghost imaging okay so i've got my ultraviolet light coming in here's my little crystal and it makes a pair of photons one i've imagined here in the visible and one here in the infrared infrared photons are really hard to detect really hard visible light is dead easy 
we've got all sorts of devices um, that, that, that are really efficient on visible light. So what I'm going to do is image this object using these twin beams. OK. Notice it's the infrared light that sees the object. And there's a bucket detector over here, which just says, yeah, I've got some light. OK, visible light comes this way as recorded in the camera. It's the camera over here that produces the image of that object, which the visible light never saw. But because these twin beams are highly correlated, the detection of one allows you to infer what the other one has seen. And that's ghost imaging. Now, I'm putting this in as a teaser because just looking at this, you think, how can it possibly work? How can I get an image in this camera, a visible light of an object it never, ever encountered? OK, it works. It works beautifully. Um, it work with classical correlated light. It works much, much better with quantum light. I'll leave that in as a teaser. But I'm not making it up. It really works. It's wonderful. Right. Now I'm, now I'm going to talk about um, communication using these streams of photons. Imagine a situation where I've got a legitimate sender, A for Alice, is going to send some stuff through a hostile network to a legitimate receiver, Bob. OK, and it's a hostile network with these droppers. So what I'm going to do is take my unprotected data and I'm going to fold it in by some mathematical transformation with a secret key. OK. Now that encrypted data comes on through the hostile network and now Bob, the legitimate user, to get the unprotected data back also possesses that key and can invert the, uh, the mathematical operation and gets the data back. This eavesdropper, of course, has no ability whatsoever to unlock it unless he has got hold somehow of the key. So what can we do in, using quantum physics to make sure that only Alice and Bob actually have copies of those keys? And that's what quantum physics allows you to do. OK, I'll come back to that. So why should we worry about about quantum physics providing something that's secure? Aren't we secure anyway? And then here's here's why we start to worry. People in the 1980s started to look at what was different about a quantum system compared with a classical system. Richard Feynman over here on the left was really one of the first to, to really systematically investigate the way that it's very hard to simulate a quantum system on a classical machine. The first person to actually work out that if you had a quantum machine, you could do calculations that might be either hard or impossible for a classical machine to do was David Deutsch in Oxford. And this is David. I must replace this image. This is Peter Shaw, now at, at MIT, but used to be uh, at Bell Labs. Peter's now grown a beard. Um, and Peter in 1994 said, if you had a quantum machine, using the kind of analysis that, that, that Deutsch did, it has a capability to change what used to be thought of as hard to say that become became easy. And in particular, factoring became easy with a quantum computer, although factoring is hard. Why should anybody care about factoring? It's the difficulty of factoring underpins the security of our IT systems. OK. What we tend to do in public key cryptography, and you, you, you almost certainly use this with RSA, is you, you're depending on the difficulty of factoring a large number. So here's a, lar a large number. This is the number called RSA 200, and that's its, that's its prime factors. And if you try to work out how to, how, to, how to find those factors from this big number, it really is just exponentially hard. A classical machine just takes forever and ever. You know, the, the larger the number, the worse it gets exponentially. 
But what Peter Shaw showed is that if you had a quantum machine that could do something called a quantum Fourier transform, instead of being exponential, it became polynomial. So that a thing that might take the age of the universe to crack comes down to ours. That ability to change from exponential to polynomial is the major threat to our crypto systems because the way that we distribute keys in public key cryptography is contingent on it really being hard to find those prime factors. Okay. So do we need to worry about it? So I, I quite like this one. This is this, this. Sometimes I call this the Mosca equation uh, after the originator, uh, Michele Mosca in Waterloo in Canada. How long do you need your cryptographic keys to be secure? That's your shelf life security. Let's call it X. How much time would it take to retool the existing infrastructure with a solution that's quantum safe? Let's call that Y, that's your migration time. And then finally, how long would it take for a large scale quantum machine to be built that will enable us to realize this sure algorithm? Let's call that Z, the collapse time. And the, and the Mosca theorem is if X plus Y is greater than Z, then you worry, you panic in fact. So what are the time scales? Well, the time scales have been reduced quite a lot. The, time, the collapse time is now thought to be of the order of a decade to build a larger scale machine. How long does it take to retool the internet? Probably about a decade. When do you start working on it? How about now? Okay, and that's the basic underlying message that we need to retool the machinery. Right, so the best estimates that we had um, from, from three years ago is a large scale quantum computing machine is about 10 to 15 years away. Um, and therefore, there was a one in seven chance of your cryptographic primitives being affected by quantum attacks by 2026 and one in two by 2031. Those numbers have come down in the last three years. OK, so that's that's the threat. And Michele Mosca um, is, is the world expert on that. So you might have this great cybersecurity fortress, depending your uh, uh, defending your system. But as soon as we can start finding these prime factors, RSA and the whole of public key infrastructure collapses. Right. So how can we establish keys? Um, there are ways of doing it. By the way, you can always build a quantum safe algorithm classically as well. There's no proof that it's safe. It's just thought to be safe. That's a fragile thing to depend on. But can we how can we share random numbers? And I'm going to show you how to use quantum physics to do it. I can't resist this, this Dilbert cartoon. Down in his dungeon, he's got a random number generator. And he comes up with a string, nine, 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 nine. How do you know that string is random? And that's the problem with a finite string length. OK, so can we develop random, trustable strings? And there are toolboxes we can do use to use this. One way of doing it is to build quantum random number generators where we make we, we get photons that are born. OK, uh, there's a source of photons. This is a beam splitter. Some get ref reflected, some get transmitted. And you look over here and, and of course, it's random whether it gets transmitted or reflected. 50-50 beam splitter will give you that, that kind of binomial distribution. So that's your certifiable, if you do it right, that's your certifiable random number generator. And, and, and a number of people worked on the theory of that, and the number of companies are now marketing such things. You can build a, a post-quantum algorithm, which is thought to be quantum resistant, no proof of it, but, but it, they look promising. And then there's a quantum key distribution that I'm going to explain. Okay, so, one of the most interesting things about quantum systems under control is that when you try to interrogate them, you modify the state of the quantum system. So my legitimate sender, Alice, going to Bob, and I can send a one as a circularly polarized photon, for example. 
Eve doesn't know what the basis is, says, mm, what if it's linear and has a go at it? OK, but that out of measurement disturbs what you're measuring. And so the eavesdropper is revealed. OK, can only access partial information is revealed. And, and you, what you can do, therefore, is build uh, a distribution system that, 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 that really is such that you can be revealed if you're eavesdropping and you can be assured that you're not. OK. So here's an early uh, trusted node demonstrator. This is exchanging quantum keys between the British Telecom Labs at Astral Park in Martlesham in Suffolk via the Ipswich Exchange down installed British, good old BT fibre down to the Cambridge Exchange and, and, and then at Cambridge University. And that's been used to distribute encrypted video between one and the other. But I was at the other end uh, of this thing when we launched this thing. The minister was at the other end. What about longer ones? Well, the Chinese, of course, have got this massive one between Beijing and Shanghai uh, with, with relays and all sorts of things. There are lots of banks uh, that are customers for this. Most interesting development. So that's true for what happens if you distribute these things quantum mechanically down fiber. But what about getting from one continent to another? And of course, that's a global key distribution network. And it was this satellite that was launched from China, the Mesia satellite, which started to demonstrate the power of this. Um, uh, uh, and the Mesia satellite launched in August 2016, gave the ability to actually generate these kind of keys. Um, in fact, in 2017, uh, a quantum secured video conference, not between Martinsham and Cambridge this time, but between Beijing and Vienna by Zhang Wei Pan in one place uh, in Beijing. And this is Anton Zeilinger, one of the great heroes of the field down in Vienna. So with a single hop between Beijing, the satellite and Vienna. Now what about computation? Computation is a physical process. Now, that's a statement that conventionally has computer scientists getting very upset. They think it's an abstract process, but it's run on hardware, so it obeys the laws of physics. What would a quantum computer look like? And I can't resist this. There's a great quote. Computers of the future may weigh no more than 1.5 tons. And that was in Popular Mechanics in 49. And what I'm going to show you is, is some very early prototype quantum machines which certainly do appear to weigh about 1.5 tons. But, you know, there, there's a lot of progress happening. Right. So the basic idea of quantum computing is this business of, uh, of taking n quantum bits, qubits, putting them into superposition so the state space you can access grows exponentially. It's like 2 to the 9. But it's like an absolutely massive parallel computer. Um, and there are lots of algorithms that people are investigating and proposing. And so there's a there's a web link there. So I think called the quantum algorithm zoo, which run, runs through the, the pros and cons of various algorithms that have been proposed. What resource do they take? How would you implement them? OK, so when you look up the quantum algorithm zoo for 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 this, this is what you end up with, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip over most of it because it's really quite um, uh, it's quite technical, but it just demonstrates what it would do in terms of the speed up, and the speed up is very profound, and therefore we know that that once one is able to build a reasonably large number of quantum bits, we can undermine the whole business of public key cryptography and the way that we secure internet and much more. So that's an example of what's in the quantum zoo. We'll skip over it because it is quite technical. It's worth a look though. So last gold quantum inference, that, that's the, the resource we're going to use. Um, and what, what can we do with it? Well, how can we implement it even? So the, down, down here is, is an iron trap. Is, these are laser cooled ions, atomic ions, laser cooled, manipulated, uh, and that's very much the approach being used uh, by groups in Oxford and the Sussex and elsewhere. That's the kind of chip that will go inside these things. 
okay manipulating the ions that hover just above them and on the right hand side this is the kind of thing that goes inside a cryostat for the superconducting realization that i think that's a google one okay so when we started to worry about these things back in 1996 there was a great chasm between what we knew we could actually do in the laboratory making errors and what was required to do something non-trivial 10 percent errors that, that was going pretty good actually and a huge huge gap uh, because we needed exquisite control to run the algorithms so how long was it take was it going to take to close that chasm it's a chasm of 10 to the 4. Um, and, and people ran a guessing game, actually. Uh, some people said a few years, some said a few decades, and there were a few people that said, it's not going to be possible ever to close this gap. So how do things look 20 years later? The gap's closed. But extraordinary progress. Theorists have, have dropped down their demands by having clever and clever ways of predicting the uh, protecting bits. The experimentalists have, have proved masters of control systems that are exquisitely accurate. So it took two decades to close that gap. Right. So who's doing the gap closing? Lots of technologies, lots of research groups, lots of research centers um, using iron traps, superconducting qubits. Um, nitrogen vacancy uh, sensors in diamond, photons, silicon, topological bits. That, that's the punt that Microsoft is taking. And the companies Google, IBM uh, and Microsoft are the famous ones. Lots of people working on starting to work out how to get that scale up. So we've got to do something about bridging that gap. 20 qubits, straightforward. 50 qubits been achieved, for example, uh, by Google. Two to the 50 is already an extraordinarily large number. That's what led to what they call quantum supremacy and what we've tried to relabel as a quantum advantage. Already here, we're seeing an advantage of a quantum system over a classical one. We might want to take uh, um, a number of really fragile steps out here working out ways in which we correct quantum errors. Okay, so lots of startups working in this space now. Um, not only startups, but the big boys as well. So in superconducting systems, Intel, IBM and Google are all working on these things. Um, Chad Rigetti uh, came out of, uh, of IBM with his own startup, which is now prospered. Uh, okay, there are um, iron trap spin outs. There's iron Q in the United States. Um, and there is an iron trap spin out of great promise also here, Oxford Ionics. We could also build photonic chips where the photons engage with each other in a photonic quantum platform. And, and that's an approach taken by Xanadu in North America, but also by PsyQuantum, which was a group that came out of Bristol and Imperial College, but are actually based in, in California on the realization of this particular thing. And then the semiconductor, this is Michelle Simmons, who leads the tremendous effort in Australia on this. So, are we gonna get there? There's always a danger in any of these fields that the advocates like me are guilty of, of a kind of self-deception and a hype. Um, so this is a this is a um, a graph that's sometimes called the Gartner hype cycle. Okay, um, and technology often has this kind of of curve. Uh, this is visibility of the field versus time. There's a technological trigger, lots of lots of ambition and aspiration and hopes. There's the peak of inflated expectation and then the collapse down to the trough of disillusionment. That's great language. And then suddenly people start to think, oh, well, I know how to deal with this. The slope of enlightenment and then the plateau of productivity. Right. So the next one from Gartner tries to indicate where we might be. OK, it's a very busy slide um, and a lot of your favorite technologies are going to be on this slide. Um, and, uh, you know, there's the Internet of Things that's about to fall over down into the trough. OK, but quantum computing is. 
in here somewhere. I've lost it, but it's in there somewhere. So I don't think we're hyping the field up. In fact, one of the features of quantum technologies is that we are, have been extraordinarily cautious to say this is a long game. Um, but things that are already emerging from the field, the novel imaging cameras, the sensors, the clocks, the timing, are all producing things of value. I think that probably finding a way to get from over here, the peak of inflated expectations, over to here, the plateau of productivity where we're generating economic value, high value jobs and the rest of it, that transition is the tough bit. And that's where the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund is, is helping us to bridge some of these things and pull stuff through to a productive future. And that's my last slide. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Peter, for that um, very enlightening talk. Um, we've got a few questions lined up, um, and hopefully while I ask those, um, a few more might come in from the audience, um, but we're already pretty good on time, so we can just uh, have a little chat and then wrap this up. So um, I I would like to ask, um, you know, if this becomes commonplace fairly soon, what benefits do I get as a person who who just goes about my daily business? What what benefits will I see if I, for example, replace my desktop computer with a quantum computer? Are there immediate things that that will benefit me, or other than enhanced security, or is this something that will be reserved for research and things? I I well, please don't hold your breath waiting for a, uh, a quantum laptop. It ain't going to happen because the infrastructure is always quite complicated. What I suspect will happen is that we will see um, the ability to do cloud computing using our quantum computer. Indeed, you can do that already. And via the cloud, if you want to, um, you can access the IBM machine. Um, via Amazon Web Services, you can access a number of different platforms. Um, and that may be the way to do it. In other words, there'll, there'll be a dedicated machine somewhere. Now, what would you do with it you can't already do? Because of this ability to get this enormous state space, you can start to do optimization and simulations that just aren't going to be feasible using a classical machine in a reasonable time scale. So we can model um, the way that, that molecules evolve, change their con conformation, and that will give us a handle on the way that we, we discover new drugs and how they get through cell membranes and so on. Drug discovery. Um, uh, we have a collaboration uh, with Johnson Matthey on working out how we model new materials that are relevant to new batteries. So simulation is actually give me the name of the game, but also optimization. So, for example, while you're waiting for your Amazon delivery, someone has had to optimize how that delivery service mm -hmm. worked to get that package to you. That that optimization problem is technically complex. There are quantum algorithms already that will begin to look at ways in which that could be delivered more, more, more effectively. So maybe just, just hanging around waiting for your Amazon parcel might be the first thing that will affect you. But it will it will transform our ability to simulate and, and to do that kind of optimization, but it will be done almost certainly via cloud computation. So what I'm hearing there is video games. Uh, there are quantum games. Um, I, I have a, a former student, Barry Sanders, up in Calgary, who leads a very distinguished research group, who as a kind of sideline activity has got all sorts of quantum games running and they are good fun. Um, you can do a quantum Minecraft if you really are so minded. But optimization is, is going to be the name of the of, of the initial game, but also the beginnings of ways in which uh, molecules are created and, 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 and conformally change during reactions. For example, we spend an enormous amount of money on fertilizers. And understanding that basic process is a computationally intensive process. Uh, and, and so I know that the um, uh, the Microsoft group are looking very closely at the way a quantum computer would transform that ability to model that system. Um, 
sorry, we've had a we've had a really good question in from uh, one of our professors at the Open University. Um, so he says uh, in his email, novelist Kurt Vonnegut memorably said that science is magic that works. It sounds like future quantum technologies could look like magic the first time we see them. Is there something quantum that you can see coming that might simply look like magic to the public? Yeah, I think I tried to explain that ghost imaging one, mm -hmm. which is really pretty counterintuitive, isn't it? Um, that that does look like magic. Um, by the way, I, I I try really hard not to use the word spooky around quantum because it 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 slides us almost imperceptibly into the kind of mysticism that I don't think really helps in this. Um, but there are some very counterintuitive things because. Our intuition is based on the classical world around us, and we're not really prepared for the, some of the peculiarities of the quantum world. So it's counterintuitive, is is right. I think Im that imaging stuff is is, is part of it. Um, but you know, who would have thought that putting things into superposition would have given us GPS? You know. So one of the things that I also try to do, by the way, is, is, is to try to when I'm talking to politicians, the people that are we, we're only advisors, they're the deciders. It's best to explain what you can do with stuff, not how it works, but what does it do? So if we're going to build a surveying instrument that, that looks at brownfield sites, you better not have a PhD in physics to do it. It better be robust that anybody can use. And so it, we need to talk about uh, about capabilities rather than how it... After all, you don't actually know what's going on in your mobile phone. The physics of what's going on in your mobile phone is impenetrable to most of us. The same is true of quantum. Great answer. Um, can I just ask you to maximise your screen so that you're not sharing your desktop because you're still sharing your screen, so... Oh, um, how do I do that? Just uh, I think one of the buttons, buttons top left uh, on the Mac. Uh, top left, one of the red or the green or the or the yellow. It's one of those, isn't it? Yeah, the green maybe. Uh, Not that one. <laughs> that one then. Yeah, 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 we'll get there. How about so, that? Um, yes, great. Can I just remind the audience, please, if you're there and you haven't done so already, can you please fill out the demographic Google form? Um, there's a link to it on the stadium page. Um, that will really help us to understand who we're reaching with these lectures. Um, I had a question for my own interest. Um, so I work in, in the field of space images. Um, so I'm interested in, I know, I know there are upcoming space demonstrations of quantum technology um instruments um such as a gravity imager that could map out the density of minerals in the earth um from space um i was wondering if you could comment on the progress and challenges of moving quantum technology into space applications in the space environment um it is really very very challenging uh, although scientific progress has been made already in in quite a remarkable way so, for example, in a collaboration between Europe and the United States on a mission led by JPL, they did manage to generate a Bose condensate in space. And that's kind of fun, really, because you can start thinking about, you know, how 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 do how does a ball of cold atoms behave in a zero gravity environment and so on. So that was already done um, and results on that particular experiment started to come out a few months ago. So so the, the ability to make cold matter in space has already been demonstrated. And of course, um, it, it was done on the space station, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but there are many other things that you can do in that sense. Um, one of the things that we 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 know we want to be able to do is is what you just said. How how on a low Earth orbit um satellite would you, would you do uh gravimetry of, of actually looking at the mass distribution uh, that is a tough challenge it's not going to be delivered immediately although the birmingham uh group that coordinate the uh um the timing and sensing work for us um ha have aspirations to move exactly in that space um so so yeah you're right that that mapping out the geoid is something that 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 is is one of their target lists of what to do. Where you, where you're able to to build these gravity instrumentations 
systems in space. It's quite a challenge, though. Uh, at the beginning, what you will we will be doing is is flying basically proof of concept experiments like the Bose condensate uh, that was done by JPL. OK, that's really interesting. Thank you so much. We've got another question uh, from the audience um, from C. Scott, and he's asking if um, the quantum breaking of RSA, um, if that is replicated among other encryption methods or are there, I guess he's asking if there are other encryption methods that are maybe harder to crack with a quantum computer that exists at the moment, or do we need to develop uh, better algorithms for the future? Um, basically, all of the current public key infrastructure that we use, um, that that's elliptic curve or RSA or whatever, they're all vulnerable to the quantum attack of the kind that Peter Shaw envisaged. So all of our cryptographic primitives in public key infrastructure are vulnerable. There are approaches that are thought to be quantum safe that somehow are immune to attacks by things like the quantum Fourier transform that Shaw used. They're thought to be safe. There are no security proofs. And of course, one of the dangers is always that um, out there somewhere is a new really smart guy like Peter Shaw will say, I can get into it. So, for example, we came quite close to coming up with uh, a new algorithmic method for distributing keys called Soliloquy that was road tested. It had a trapdoor. So that got pulled quite rapidly. Uh, but people have tried to, to, to fly these things. There is a competition except that they refuse to call it a competition for coming up with with potential candidates that are quantum safe. And out of close to 100 candidates, it's got narrowed down to about 15. And that's been coordinated by NIST in the United States. And, 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 and there are at least there's at least one, maybe two from the UK on that candidate list. And what will happen is that there will be really strenuous red and, and blue teaming to have a go at it to see whether it's got any vulnerabilities because you don't want to roll this out and find you you know all that money and you've you've just wasted your time my big worry about this is that um the the only cryptographic system that is provably safe and shannon proved it is a one-time pad nothing else is provably safe okay so who knows in the future and engineering a whole new infrastructure to secure the internet takes time so there are there are systems hash based systems and so on uh, that that might be useful candidates but they're being stress tested at the moment okay that's very interesting thank you um your camera has turned off i think probably when you minimize the window by oh, accident can oh. you just try and restart it yeah, got it. And then I think I think we've got one final um, question, Have which you got is me maybe there? you got me back on now. Got you there. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, you're very small, but it'll do. Um, <laughs> I have no idea how to make you bigger. <laughs> I think maybe it's uh, uh, on our AV end rather than your end, so don't worry. Um, so maybe this is a good one to end it on. Um, you've talked about what people expected computing to look like 50 years ago. Are you able to make a prediction here about, uh, you know, where we'll be in the next 50 years? Um, I think I think 50 years, it, it, whatever I say, I'm going to be absolutely wrong. OK, uh, who, you, you know that when they first started to think about a computer, uh, they thought maybe the world would, would, would only need three. OK, that was Thomas J. Watson's prediction. OK, the, the founder of IBM, basically. So whatever I say will be wrong. What I, su what I suspect will happen is that we'll, we'll, we'll make much more rapid progress than I thought. Um, earlier in the summer, uh, one of the, the, the measures of, of how good you were in building a platform was a thing called a quantum volume. And the best anybody could do in quantum volume was the IBM group who came up with the concept in the first place with a quantum volume of 64. Two weeks ago, there was a press release from IonQ, this, the Iron Trap quantum computing spin out in the United States that was covered in, in New Scientist with a quantum volume of 4 million. You know, 
whatever I say now, it will be completely wrong next year. But what I will say is that that progress is going to be phenomenal. And it's going to be a real roller coaster, enjoyable, fun ride, because the physics behind all of this is absolutely incredibly fascinating. And and some of the, the brightest people around the world are working on it because they're having a whale of a time in uncovering new insights into the way things work. Fantastic answer. Well, I think maybe 50 years was a bit of a bit of a long time span to ask for, especially at the, the pace that the world moves at today. Well, um, given my advanced age, I want to see something that does something non-trivial before I drop dead of COVID. <laughs> OK. OK, there we go. There's a, there's a challenge for any scientist listening. Um, OK, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for um, spending your time with us this evening. It's been a fascinating talk, um, especially enjoyed putting it in the bigger picture of, of um, the global economy and, and you know, the, the way it's going to, to change the way we think about things. So thank you so much for that. Um, I wish I could give you a round of applause. I haven't got a <laughs> I haven't got a sound file queued up or anything, but um, I'll sort that out for the next one online. Um, well, thanks again for asking me. But, you know, it's a great journey. If anybody's seriously interested in, in knowing a bit more, um, find a way of emailing me and I'll get in touch. OK. Yeah, well, um, people can just email us at our email address and we can put you in touch or we can forward questions on or um, we, we can do anything that people might might want to happen. Um, um, so thank you also to our audience for joining us tonight. Um, thank you to anyone who's managed to fill out the Google form for us. Um, and I will just recap on what we're expecting to happen in the coming months with these lectures. Um, so we have... Um, it's looking likely that we're going to have a talk on the, the dawn of gravitational wave astronomy by, by Dr. Chris North um, at 8 p.m. on the 10th of November. And then it's likely that we will have a talk on the moon with the talk is still be to uh, still to be decided. Um, and that will be at 7.30 on December the 8th. But um, keep an eye out for announcements by the IOP or on our Twitter. And that's at um, OU underscore SBS. Um, for more information as we get closer to those dates. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, and have a have a nice rest of your week and a nice evening. And um, see you for the next one. Right. Thank you, Ben. Bye-bye, then. Cheers. Bye.